Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. John and Michael, how are you today? Eric, you're doing great. Doing great, Eric. How are you? I am doing fantastic. I'm, I'm excited. You've got another guest on the show. And Michael, I know that you're going to be introducing the guest today. Who is it? Yes, we do. Uh, th- this is a actually a first time for us. This is a, actually we're going to have a client, uh, a longtime client on as a guest today. We have with us today Mr. Robert Brown. He is the CEO and president of American Asphalt Companies. And he's, a, again, a longtime family CFO client of ours. And we invited Robert on the call today to really talk with us a little bit on leadership, leadership in business, leadership in family, families. And, and that's something we've talked about a good number of times on the podcast and in terms of how important it is for, particularly for generational wealth, to really transfer that leadership mantle to whether it's the next generation of a family or the next generation of leadership in a business. And when my father and I were going back and forth on potential guests, Bob immediately Top came to mind. Top of the list. Lines. Yeah, <laughs> on, for this particular topic. Bob, welcome today. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Let's jump right in here to this. So I, again, I know you've had a successful business career throughout your life, and I, I know from prior conversations with you, leadership has really been an, an important component, I know for you personally, but also in terms of business success and, and being able to generate a, a really successful long-term, I, dare I say, generational business, leadership is very important. So why don't you, if you can, maybe give a little bit of your history, who you are, and how you got started with leadership as a, as a core concept for your philosophy? Well, I Got started as a teenager working some jobs like working in a gas station and working for somebody outside the family. So I was treated like an employee, given the opportunity to have some responsibility and sort of understood from a young age what it was like to be a leader, even a leader of two or three other people in a gas station type environment. Then I transitioned into the third generation of our family heating, air conditioning and fuel oil business And I was able to watch my father in his leadership style and how he ran his business and learn from him and have him mentor me. And to the the point when I was 19 years old, my father had the wherewithal to teach me leadership to invest some money and, and allow me to have my own business. So he lent me money and I started an auto parts business. From an early age, I was given the reins, given the responsibility and quickly learned what it takes to have employees that are going to be loyal and trustworthy and lead by example. Yeah, that's a really interesting story. I mean, in terms of borrowing money from your father at 19 and that's uh and by the way, if there's ever a consummate entrepreneur, it's Mr. Brown on 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 the call with us today. He's uh, you know, and that just showcases it right there being 19 and and borrowing money from your father. I mean, that's a very mature decision to really make as a 19 year old, really at any age, believe it or not, but that, but at 19 in particular. So, I mean, that's really, really interesting. I think on that, the maturity came from my father that, uh, his accountant and attorneys were advising him is I would never grow in the family business while he was the CEO. The way to learn business was to go do it for myself. It wasn't me chasing him to lend me the money. It was really a, an investment. And he lent me $50,000 was the amount in 1974. Yeah. It was a lot of money back then. But if you consider what it would cost you to train a CEO in the business for the risk he took, I mean, he had you know some inventory to secure the money t- type of thing in the store. But it was a great investment on his part to be able to mentor me, but allow me to run in a small business that if I failed, it wasn't the end of the world and groom me to take over his seat in the family business, which I later did. That's really interesting. You mentioned failures, Bob. I'm interested to hear what what sort of growing pains did you have on this journey to being a a business leader that you might want to share with the audience? And what what are the things that you learned uh, the hard way in, in this journey? (laughs) <laughs> wow, there's a there's a lot of uh, lessons and times I fell down. And, and as they say, it doesn't matter how many times you fall down. It's about how many times you get back up. 
when I failed and perhaps didn't hire the right person, trusted people, gave credit where credit shouldn't have been given and had minor losses that certainly trained me through my business career. And probably some of my bigger failures were in trusting other people where I was too trusting. And that is my heart is to trust maybe too soon. I bought a little electronic marine business. I was the absentee owner and I trusted the employees that were there to run it for me. And that ended poorly that I I lost money on that and had to close the store because they weren't trustworthy. That trust continues on to this day in the business that I'm currently in with 170 employees. It's the key word of how we denote our business. It's on the side of every dump truck that we own. It says trusted because we want to be trusted by our customers. But in order to do that, you have to earn trust of your employees, give trust to your employees to, ha- to work and live in a trusting environment. So to me, trust is really a, a key word for my past. Bob, let's jump into the family side of things, because you and I, as leaders of our businesses, you and I are similar age, finding leadership in the family to carry on a business enterprise or to carry on the family enterprises, you and I have had hours of conversations about that. When you look at your your family, what, what instincts do you have to have to pick that next leader of the family or... Or, or have trust, to your, to your point, in a family member to take the legacy that you've developed or the, all, all the values you've developed through your lifetime. How do you know to trust that going forward? That's difficult because when you overlay the emotional connection to a family member into the business environment, ah, yes. which already is, is challenging enough, and it's like coaching your own kid in a sport. You're either too hard on them or too soft on them. And and in business, you have the same dream. You want them to take over for you. And maybe you have blind spots. You don't see where they're weak or you give them preferential treatment. So there's, there's so many traps. You really need professional advice, probably some outside advice, certainly some key advisors in the company that can help you balance whether you're offspring or family member is capable of taking the reins and running it the way you want to run it. And, and nobody runs it the way you want to run it. So our own ego gets in the way is yeah, with the I way agree. we do things is always right. And the next generation may have a better idea, or at least they think it's a better idea. And sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But uh, I guess it's just a very difficult task to transition to a family member. And a lot of times your wealth is tied up in the business and therefore you're given the keys to the golden goose to the next generation and your retirement is dependent on their success. So you're betting your livelihood on the success of that person. That's a big decision that I would recommend you get some counsel before you try to do it on your own. Yeah, I've I've always had a saying that uh, our, our job in life when we look at our families or businesses or things we do professionally is, is my job is not to motivate people is to find motivated, motivated people. In other words, you, you know, when you look at my family as an example, you worked with me and Michael a while now, my job is not to motivate Michael to take charge of the business. He's got to be motivated to do that and work very closely with me to accommodate that. Do, do you find that that's consistent in your, in running your, your company? Do you find your employees, have that motivation to move the company forward based on your focus and your vision? Because the challenge we both have, you and I, Bob, if we're not, when we're no longer here, who takes on that, that mantle to move that forward? Or how do you trust those employees in your company to, to carry on with your vision? Is, is that something you think about often and, and, and are challenged by? Well, it's certainly challenging because I've had key people leave me through my business career people that I thought were tried and true blue on always going to be on my right hand uh, that turned out they had other ideas or it just didn't pan out. Trusting of, of other people is critical, but if they demonstrate trustworthy behavior, you engage with them and you trust with them, and then if you interject the family into it, who's better suited to run your business? A highly paid executive that's been with you for a while or 
a, a family member that comes in and just because they have your same last name, somehow they, they go to the top of the list. You, you're, yeah. If you're looking at longevity of your business and the chance of success, and I know, John, you talk about that shirt sleeve axiom where in the third generation, the first generation builds the business up, the second one sort of fine tunes it, runs it well, and the third one loses it. So if you're whatever stage you're in in your family business life, if you're at that third generation, you're at a great risk of handing it to some family member that doesn't understand the hard work it took to get it to where it's successful and then their poor behaviors poor choices could easily lead to a financial calamity yeah and i've, and I've watched you work through the years and and i'll use the word coach because i think you're a great coach to your employees and i i watched how you handled your managers and your and your growth in your company Communication, obviously, is the key to all this. And, I, and again, you and I go back for hours and talking about how we talk to the family members and have family meetings with the kids. So communication is a key aspect. In your business, how often do you meet with your, your top manager managers to, to get a sense of what's going on? Is that, a, is that a weekly event? Is that a monthly event? Is that a quarterly event? How do you, how do you handle that in, in, in your business? It's a weekly event that I meet with my top team as a group for a weekly management meeting where we discuss top level issues, not the, not the, how the nuts and bolts, I don't want to micromanage my people. So I'm there as a sounding board. I'm there to brainstorm, fact find, try to figure out how to uh, accomplish our goals. It's a weekly thing, but then there's a daily interaction between my top staff and myself where they'll it, just ask for a few minutes of my time. If they have an issue, they want to, bounce something off me or likewise if I have a brainstorm of something that I think we ought to do as a business I like to bounce it off of them but Copper Beach you helped me to take the business from an entrepreneurial style managed where I was the owner 100% shareholder made all the decisions and had a management team to a professional style business where I'm the owner but I'm no longer working in the business I'm working on the business so you have to elevate yourself very difficult to do. Give away all the jobs you do every day and let others do the work so you can be the visionary. You can cast where you're going to go. And that certainly giving the power to your team at that professional level makes it a professional business. Otherwise, you're at risk that if you get hit by the bus and you're the entrepreneurial style, your business could well not survive. Copper Beach was instrumental in, in shining a light on that weakness in my in my life that I took it to heart that I really needed to grow. And it's a painful growth to give up what you do and, and give it to others, but it's necessary for the long-term success of the business. Yeah. And that's, and I appreciate that feedback, Bob, because working on the business or working on your families is a challenge. It's not easy to do. It's something that to your point, it's not easy to step away. And here at Copper Beach, and you know how Michael and I work together. I, I try to give Michael all the freedom and flexibility to do what he thinks is is proper from from his leadership position in, in the firm and i try to stay out of his way but we often and michael and i talk all the time which that's what makes it work i'm fortunate to have someone that i work with that listens and doesn't doesn't fight me a lot and respects my decisions and the way i operate and just adds on to that as a value proposition so it's 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 hard to work on the business and on your family but it's a daily activity and i think you'll agree it's something you work on now going forward every day because the older we get the more complex our world is isn't it isn't it bob it yes seems, it seems to be that way i don't know no. well bob to add to that i know when when we were sort of talking about today's podcast you mentioned the formal sort of leadership training activity that you have within within your company and i'm interested to pick your brain a little bit on why you went to that route to have more of a formal program in place. I know a lot of companies maybe will have more of an informal leadership training regime, but you decided to go with a more formal one. Can you talk a little bit about that decision-making process? Well, as, as we wanted to professionalize the business and you need bench strength and everybody sort of needs to approach their job that they can replace themselves. A, a successful person in any position isn't holding on to it for their own job security and ego, but they should be looking under them to train somebody. So with some advice from outside groups, uh, I belong to CEO peer groups and such, 
it made sense to look at our own workforce and identify high potential employees is what we call them. We could take somebody that's only been with us a year, but we see potential in that person and we formalized it and outsourced a a leadership academy that we run. And we have a beginner's level, an intermediate level and a executive level. And as people grow, it's a one year course. They meet one full business day each month for 10 months and then we have a graduation ceremony and what we found is great workers come in and they may know they may be good tradespeople and they may have skills but nobody's ever taught them how to read a balance sheet nobody's taught them how to resolve human conflict how to manage their time and plan their day and and the leadership skills you need we took a serious thing instead of doing it ad hoc once in a while when we get time to a dedicated professional teacher with a curriculum and People have to vie to get in that course. They have to ask their supervisor to sponsor them, and we evaluate them, and we only allow six or seven people a year to go into this leadership academy. But after doing it for the last four years, we have a bench of about 20 people that are here that have all had some management training. They're ready to move up to the next level as soon as there's an opening to go, whether it's through growth or whether it's through turnover. So we look at it. It's a long-term goal to grow a staff that's capable of managing the business. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a great process, but it's it's great to see that work. I'm gonna ask this, uh, maybe it's a simple question, or, or maybe it's a it's a hard question. When you interview someone for a top position in your firm, do you, do you look do you look for certain qualities in your business, or is it or is it general leadership qualities you look for? You tell me how that interview goes, and, and, and what do you look for? People are savvy. A lot of people interview very well, and my trusting naivete or (laughs) believe in what people say at first glance is challenging. We've turned our hiring, especially at the higher level, into a process. We have a score sheet. Multiple people will uh, interview the person and we will ask them similar questions. We will rate them on the answers to those questions. Then we'll compare our score sheets and determine if he falls into different levels, whether he's a candidate for hire or we're going to pass on the person or maybe he's in the middle. And we also outsource a uh, professional profile that they do from home online. It takes about an hour, hour and a half, and they'll answer questions and it's geared so they they can't really fool the test. If they try to fool the test, that shows up as well. But we're going to look at their traits, how they truly are, how they are under conflict. And we share that with a candidate too, because it's a growth thing for them. And it's funny, most candidates read it and say, oh, that's not me. And we say, take it home, show it to your wife. And they show it to their wife and they said, oh, that's you. That is exactly (laughs) it. We we get a report card on these people (laughs) of what are they good at? And we don't want all the same kind of people. So looking at like a disc profile, you know, we need some high D's, we need some high I's, we need some high C's. Going together as a team, that's what makes a team strong. That allows us to identify the type of leaders they are, how they want to be communicated with, what would drive them crazy if we treated them a certain way. So it, it gives us great insight. And the whole, uh, it's just a tool in our belt, but we try to make a good hire. It costs so much money to make a bad hire, oh, train, yeah. change your mind a year later and turn over and the, and the impact on the other people. We really make a concerted effort to vet somebody out, check their references, test them, and then you know, make an appropriate hire. Bob, when did you decide to implement such a formal process? I'm, I'm wondering, was there a, 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 an employee number that, that you had where you said we need to really take this more seriously? Or was that something that you've always had in, in your business world, that, that this process? No, when you're an entrepreneur, you have the last say, you make all the decisions. So I hired who I wanted and made my mistakes. And, you know, you like to think you hire right most of the time. And, and it probably is most of the time, but the 20% that you, you made a poor decision, you know, haunts you. Uh, so as you transfer to a professional organization and management team, you're questioned by your coworkers and you need them to be able to question you as, hey, who are we hiring? What are our needs? Let's start with a job description. What is it that we need? Does this person meet that need? And how are we all going to have input on the hire? So it's not just one person who falls in love with a candidate and said, let's hire him and and runs right through the stop sign of some red flags in their resume that might be telling by formalizing it. And I guess as we 
developed our HR department and had an HR professional here. They brought some of those ideas of why don't we have a score sheet where you're asking similar questions and then we can compare notes and have a meaningful full discussion. Prior to that, we'd get in a room and it was thumbs up or thumbs down. Well, that wasn't really very scientific. Having a process certainly allowed us to have an intelligent business conversation is why do you like them? What are you afraid of? What do you think he could bring to this business type of questions? Yeah, and, and all that, all that, uh, all those processes and the success of what you're doing, Bob. I guess the key, the, the key observation would be, if you stepped away from the business for six months, how would it run? Would it continue to run, based on your vision and the implementation of of, of uh, processes you put in place? It, will your business run efficiently because of that leadership, education, training that you've developed through the years? Well, your ego always gets in the way. You know, when you think that, that, you know, you're expendable or not expendable and you're out for six months, things are really going to go poorly. But I have confidence in my management team that they could hold at least the status quo, if not grow it, but they could hold the status quo so there would be no urgency to sell the business. They would have time to decide who's the next CEO, who would fill my seat. So uh, I think having a good team around you insulates you from something happening where you you are out of the business for six months but it's also very telling when you go to sell your business and monetize your lifetime of work is if you can take off six months if you can take off two months and and take a cruise around the world or go to florida for two months that's one of the questions that a buyer would ask you is can your management team run this without you exactly. or is yeah. everybody dependent on you are they how many times you interrupted or called on vacation and if you can answer that I'm not called and I to- totally unhooked myself from the business and, and relaxed. That shows that there's value inside the business in the management structure, what you built. So the investment of building the team and testing comes home to roost when you go to, to make that succession or transition. Yeah, I can agree with you more. That, that's, that would be, that would be the win there because, because I do the same thing. You know, I go to the beach with you, Bob, every summer where Michael runs the, runs the office with, with, with my team here. And we don't really miss a beat, although I'm active, but I can walk away and know that my company will continue to run. And to your point, it might not, it might not grow at the level I could grow it at, you can grow it at, but, but the business would maintain a successful track and then things would figure their way out. Uh, if I would, if I was at, if I just disappeared and didn't, and didn't come back one day. But I, th- I, th- I, think, I think you're correct. Early in my life, when I had my auto parts store, my father was still the CEO of the family heating air conditioning business, and he had a heart attack. And they called me and said, basically, you have to leave your auto parts business and come over here and run this family business. And I didn't want to do it because the auto parts store was part and parcel of me. I had created it. That was my life. I didn't want to give it up. But the bigger business and the calling was to go to the heating business. And when I went there, my father didn't plan. He, He didn't have a choice. He was on his back in the hospital. I ran the business and I ran it more successfully than he had the prior year totally luck or God in it. Certainly wasn't my talent. But when he came back, the accountants were advising him is you should go to Florida and let the kid run it. The kid's doing good. Well, uh, well, here's the rest of the story. My dad did that and I grew the business too fast and I got myself in trouble to the point I had to sell the family business rather than go bankrupt because I made too many rash decisions or immature decisions because I was in my late 20s and I thought I couldn't go wrong. So I just spent, spent, spent and added buildings and added trucks and did other things that if my dad had more reins on me, probably wouldn't happen. But so planning ahead is, is certainly meaningful that you can't give the reins to an unproven child, even though his heart's in the right spot, he's bound to make silly decisions. What's really interesting about this this whole conversation here, this last five minutes or so, is really you know, we've had a lot of conversations on this podcast about a business succession type of plan that can come in so many different forms. And, and really what you're talking about, Bob, with the story you mentioned about your family business is and how this leadership decision really plays into that. It's really about protecting in, in your case, the business from that what if type of scenario. And sometimes, you know, we talk about whether it's a partnership, you might ha- want to make sure that your buy sell agreement is is really tightened up. And we had a, a podcast about that a good while ago. But it's really interesting to hear about how this leadership 
training or this leadership program, the focus that you make on that, how important that is to protect the business in that what if type of scenario, because it's really not just protecting the business and obviously the employees of the business, but really the value that you've worked so hard over your career to create and protect it for your family. And that's really what we're talking about. So all of these decisions working on the business versus working in the business is really so critical if you want to really protect all the hard work that that you've created. So I commend you for the efforts that you've put into that, because I'm sure as you're probably well aware, not many businesses do, and, and that's unfortunate. Let me give you guys a little credit. Uh, Copper Beach took me to a an annual financial symposium meeting that you do and introduced me to the concept of an employee stock ownership plan. And I actually executed on that plan. So my succession plan is to sell the business or I am selling the business to the employees. But by doing that, you will have a board of directors with some outside directors that are going to question you, challenge you, keep you in check. And there's a trustee who's acting on behalf of the employees to make sure what you're doing is, is good business decisions. So once again, the, the value of me being a Copper Beach client is you open my eyes to a succession plan instead of going through my family is to sell it to my employees. And that's been very successful. And that has driven some of those behaviors of you got to be professional about how you run this business because now there's many stockholders, not just one. Yeah. And, and, and that's your other family, Bob. And then we're, Correct. I remember having those conversations with you way back when, when we talk about the ESOP, is your motivation, if I recall, was you cared that much about your employee base. You groomed them to, to be part of a very successful enterprise and you wanted to reward them for that because you didn't have a son or a daughter stepping into your business from a family succession, but, but your other family was your, you know, were your employees that are, are, I would say they were as, as important as your family, but they're, cl they're close second, no doubt. It, it's, it's almost biblical. Jesus said that, you know, who is my family and it's who he was with at the time. And for the people that yeah. have been with me for 30 plus years that did all the hard work that got dirty every day, paving roads and parking lots. I mean, I felt like I owed them something and what a great way to leave the business. What a legacy and the, the tax benefits and the numbers all make sense. So this is really the perfect answer for me to exit my business. Yeah, I remember one of the questions we asked you way back when was, how do you want to be remembered? And that's a, that's a, good, that's a key question, as you know, for our, our generational or our, our moving forward from a planning standpoint, because how, your legacy is important. I know it's important to you. It's important to a lot of people we work with. So how you put that together, how you structure that has, has implications that are either negative or positive on that, how do you want to be remembered kind of question we ask. To me, when, when I get to heaven, I would love to hear God say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. Yep. So if I can share back the wealth amongst all my employees and improve that many lives and their families and the, the hundreds to the thousands of people that that cascades to, I don't know what better job I could do. And meanwhile, it worked out well for me tax-wise and wealth-wise. So it's a win-win. Yeah, that's one of them. Hey, Bob, this was great today. I, we could probably talk another two hours, all of us on, on leadership. But again, I want to thank you for your time. And I look forward to continue our relationship as we move forward together in life. Thank you. Anytime you need me, call on me. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Appreciate Bob. it. Guys, this was a fantastic podcast. Bob, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Uh, like the gentleman said, you are the first client guest. And that was fantastic. And it actually brought to mind some of the information that I've been seeing lately about the truth about wealth and, and in the statistics that we run for this podcast, uh, I've noticed there's a lot of downloads in California and many, many states all across the nation. So I just want to put a reminder out there that if you're listening to this, Copper Beach works nationwide. Gentlemen, as, as people are listening to this and saying, you know what, I really like the content. I like really wanting to plan out that generational impact that I can possibly have. What's the best way to get a hold of you? You can certainly call our office. That's area code 856-988-8300. Bob, I, I don't know if you, if you want to open yourself up to having people contact you, but you, you know, that's that, I'll leave that up to you if you'd like. Yeah, that's certainly doable. And I would just say they could contact you and feel free to share my email address with them. Perfect. All right. We can absolutely do that. Uh, guys, again, thank you so much for the content. Bob, thank you so much for being a guest. And of course, the last thank you goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. 
Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Copper Beach is not affiliated with American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., a member of FINRA SIPC, Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., an SCC Registered Investment Advisor. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Any opinion expressed in this forum is not the opinions of American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolio Advisors, Inc. and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy.